Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. Before we get into today's show, I, I want to tell you about a new offering we have here at Book of the Day. We have now launched Book of the Day Plus, which is a new way to support our work here at NPR. When you sign up, you get access to a special feed where you can listen to our new episodes sponsor-free. Nothing is changing about our regular show, but Book of the Day Plus is another way to help us keep giving you the books coverage you love. So please do sign up. We really appreciate it. You can find out more at plus.npr.org slash book of the day. All right, on to today's show. I've had this half-formed hypothesis kicking around my head lately that so many of today's authors are drawn to writing historical fiction as a way of not having to deal with tech, you know, cell phones, social media, etc. And today's interview is just evidence to back me up on that. It's with the writer Amor Tolls, whose new story collection is titled Table for Two. Most of the stories take place in the 90s or before, and he told NPR's Mary Louise Kelly that without the baggage of technology getting in the way of people, you can, quote, narrow it down to the more basic human interactions. That's after the break. This message comes from NPR sponsor Hulu. Dive into the chilling new Hulu original series, Under the Bridge, the riveting adaptation of the acclaimed true crime book. Based on shocking true events, Under the Bridge tells the haunting story of a murder that lays bare a small community's darkest secrets. Go deep into the hidden world of the town's tormented teenagers as detectives race to solve the sinister crime. Starring Riley Keough and Lily Gladstone, Under the Bridge premieres April 17th, streaming only on Hulu. At the very end of Amor Toll's first novel, Rules of Civility, his character, Evelyn Ross, is on a train. The year is 1938. She is pulling out of New York City, having just completely blown up her life there. And she's heading home to Indiana, except... She doesn't get off where she's supposed to. All we're told is she has instead extended her ticket all the way to L.A. Well, as readers, we're left wondering, why? And did she make it? And what happened next to beautiful, brilliant, damaged Evelyn Ross? Well, it turns out Amor Tolls was wondering, too. And so, last year, the author checked himself into the Beverly Hills Hotel and, as he puts it, finally gave Eve the story she deserved. The result is Table for Two, a collection of short stories, and the novella, Eve in Hollywood. Amor Tolls, hi there. Hi, thank you, Mary Louise. Is checking oneself into the Beverly Hills Hotel to write a novel as absolutely marvelous as it sounds? Well, yeah, it's not the suffering artist <laughs> this <laughs> template. This is not hardship, it's not, it's not the template of a suffering artist. No, it was, it was, it's always fun to... To step into a place like that that you're that you're writing about, uh, sort of to, to instill your writing with sort of a slightly different mood than you would have while being at home. Well, uh, for any IRS auditors listening in, I will note this was a legit <laughs> business expense. Yes. You do set most of the novella like by the pool and in the bar and in the suites of the Beverly Hills Hotel because your character Eve has checked in. Why? When I was writing the passage in Rules of Civility in which Eve was going to arrive at the train station in Chicago, where her parents were going to pick her up, as I was writing the paragraph, I stopped and thought, she would never get off that train. Oh, you know, in a so way, she, she surprised you. Yeah, she insisted that, really. So then I, I sort of on the spur of the moment, you know, it was like I had to kind of rethink and rewrite what happened to her. And, and she ends up exp- extending her ticket uh, to Los Angeles, huh. which I guess to some degree is as far away as she could get from her parents without leaving the continental U.S., right? But she's attracted probably to the glamour of it, too, in the back of my mind. She's landing there in 1938, sort of the golden uh, age of Hollywood. And she, I, I love Eve as a character, and she's a little bit of a troublemaker. She's, she's pretty willful. She's very independent-minded. And so I kind of always thought, man, she's going to, I wonder what's going to happen to her in California. She's going to cause all kinds of trouble, I'm sure. And she does. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so that was kind of the starting point. So I did all that without doing any applied research, without going to the hotel. I just did it as, as a, uh, a work of imagination. I then did... To edit it, I went and moved into the Beverly Hills Hotel for, a, you know, a less than a week um, to edit it. And that's very typical Less than a week? I would have dragged it out for, I don't know, at least two. Yeah, well, I know. You know <laughs> you're right. I mean, well, I, you know, my wife and my kids were like, what's, what, you know, Dad, what, what are you doing? So, you know, you can only get so many days in a row. But um, this sort of opens the question of why. And, and different writers approach these things in different ways. But I am a person who does like to 
write something that I feel comfortable imagining. I, I'm a fan of Hollywood in the 30s, the movies, the society of it, uh, and including the 40s. Um, so I'd like to take something that I ha- I'm familiar with, imagine it fully uh, so that it's not weighed down by sort of the burdens of research. You know, I feel like when, I do, when you do applied research, you can start to feel it in the prose. You know, it starts to be some things that are being clunked down into the narrative uh, as landmarks. And they, they're not there organically, uh, springing from the lives of the characters, springing from uh, sort of the thematic integrity of the story. And so that's been a very fruitful process for me. Speaking of Hollywood in the golden age of Hollywood, your plot here depends on the quaint notion that a photograph is exactly what it seems, could not be altered. That if, say, you had a compromising photo of a movie star, not clothed, that it is exactly what it looks like. Is that, I wondered as I read, is that part of why you set your novels all in the past? You don't have to yeah. deal with like pesky modern technology ruining your plot twists. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you know, and and in Table for Two, there's six stories, all kind of end up in New York City, but five of them are around the millennium. Mm-hmm. But even that has become a long time ago, right? You know, because some of those are 1998, and and the world today is so different from then in terms of what you're asking, in terms of what information we can get at our fingertips, how we communicate together. Uh, you know, all kinds of things have, have shifted pretty radically. And yes, it is refreshing for me as a writer to to move back into a time where there's less of all of that, where there isn't a cell phone readily at hand and there isn't Google and there isn't email. There isn't, you know, big social networks um, because you can start to n- narrow it down to the more basic human interactions. And, and that's very liberating. I, the... Lincoln Highway, my last novel, is set in 1954, and you really – it's, it's about four 18-year-olds who are friends in essence. And to bring it back to that time allows you really to see the interactions in the most direct human-to-human fashion. Well, and allows them to actually get lost on a road trip instead well, that's of true just too. following the, the blinking pin on your Google map, et cetera. Yeah, they can't find each other. They can't find each other. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right, right. Explain the title, Table for Two. Well, Table for Two, uh, what ended up happening here is I, I, I gathered the six New York stories together. I, I took this brief, this you know shorter, even Hollywood, and expanded it into this longer text. I uh, was preparing to hand in the manuscript to my publisher. And I really didn't have a title at that time. So you begin to sort of sift through, having just reread the manuscript multiple times as I'm, as I'm editing it, sifting through, is there something there that sort of pulls us together? What really leapt out at me was that in almost every story, and in in Eve, there are critical moments where there are two central characters sitting across from each other at a small table, often in a kitchen, and hashing out some significant element of their lives, which has come to the surface through the events of that particular story. Hmm. And I sort of thought, oh, that's sort of interesting. And I noticed it, let's say, for two or three stories. And then you kind of say, wait a second, what about, is it elsewhere? And then I realized, oh my God, it's in every one of them practically, I think with one exception. And, and so then that sort of opens up this sort of notion of something must have been operating in the back of my mind or subconsciously about that space, about that moment when two people face each other, something has happened, they have an intricate relationship already, their relationship may be changing because of this incident that has occurred, or something that has happened, and that they need to kind of begin to reorient themselves to each other, to themselves, as they uh, face whatever the consequences are of this thing that has happened, whatever that thing is. And, and so, so that sort of powerful moment that we all can have with our spouse, with a child, with a sibling, at that sort of moment of, a t- of one-on-one conversation across a table, suddenly I, I realized you know, that, that, that it turned out to be a central theme that I wasn't really planning on and, and thus the, the title. Well, and it speaks again to that very basic level of human interaction that you can only have face-to-face and without the intervention of technology. That's right. And, and I, I do like to think, metaphorically, of course, that an aspect of the table for two is me as the author and you as the reader. You know, the the reading of this book is a version of the reader sitting across the table from me and, and, and us having a conversation where, where I do most of the talking, but, but nonetheless, you know, a conversation. 
Amor Tolls, his wonderful new book is Table for Two. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Louise. At Planet Money, we take you to the furthest reaches of the global economy. From the currency black markets of Buenos Aires to the Caribbean island where no one owns property to the giant underground caves where the U.S. government stored a national cheese supply. Cheese cave! Listen to the Planet Money podcast from NPR. Support for NPR and the following message come from IXL Online. Is your child asking questions on their homework you don't feel equipped to answer? IXL Learning uses advanced algorithms to give the right help to each kid, no matter the age or personality. One subscription gets you everything. One site for all the kids in your home, pre-K to 12th grade. Make an impact on your child's learning. Get IXL now. And NPR listeners can get an exclusive 20% off IXL membership when they sign up today at IXL.com NPR. This message comes from NPR sponsor Mint Mobile. From the gas pump to the grocery store, inflation is everywhere. So Mint Mobile is offering premium wireless starting at just $15 a month. To get your new phone plan for just $15, go to mintmobile.com slash switch.